let's make some DNA now. This is really cool. Of course, every lecture is cool in my books. You may like some more than others. But I think the extent to which we understand virus replication is just amazing, the whole reproductive cycle. Certainly, there are lots of things we don't know. And today, we're going to talk about DNA replication. Last time, we talked about transcription. We did that first because, again, every DNA virus needs to make at least one protein before DNA synthesis ensues. We're going to talk about how the different DNA viruses reproduce their DNA genome. So let's start with the Baltimore scheme. And here we have in the middle, of course, mRNA, and surrounding it, the seven different classes of viral genomes. And today we're going to talk about viruses with DNA in the virus particle. So we're not going to talk about the retroviruses. We'll talk about those on Monday. And uh, today we're going to talk about single-stranded DNA viruses, uh, double-stranded DNA viruses. We're not going to talk about hepatinoviruses because they will be talked about next time in reverse transcription. But they do eventually end up at double-stranded DNA, and a lot of the principles we're going to talk about today apply to them, so that's why they're blue. Now, the rules for DNA synthesis are very similar to the rules for RNA synthesis, so some of these may look familiar. Again, we have template-directed synthesis. There's a DNA molecule which is copied by a polymerase to make another DNA molecule. And that template is read in the three to five prime direction. The new DNA is made in a five to three prime direction. Uh, and new triphosphates are added to the three prime hydroxyl of the growing DNA chain. It is a primer dependent reaction. In all the cases that we're gonna talk about today, DNA synthesis is a primer-dependent reaction. DNA synthesis is semi-conservative. So what that means is you take a double-stranded DNA and you separate the two strands and then you copy each one, as opposed to simply copying one strand, which is called conservative synthesis. Now there's a scheme shown here. This happens to be RNA, but it would, happen for, it would apply for DNA as well. Uh, in the middle would be our double-stranded DNA and semi-conservative replication is going up. You have the two strands being copied. Conservative, which we're not gonna talk about, you would just copy one strand, which is not great because if that strand has mutations in it, that could be a problem. Anyway, for this, the DNA synthesis we're gonna talk about today, it is semi-conservative. The DNA replication in your cells is also semi-conservative. Now there are sites in DNAs where DNA synthesis begins. Just like on a DNA template where RNA synthesis begins, we call those promoters. There are very specific sites on DNAs, we call them origins, or origins of replications, or ORIs, a couple of different ways to call it. That's what we mean by an origin. DNA synthesis, of course, is carried out by an enzyme, a DNA-dependent DNA polymerase, which has structural similarities to RNA polymerases that we talked about last time, but it also requires uh, other proteins as well. And we'll talk about some of those today. And as I said already, it is always primer dependent. Here uh, is the mechanism of DNA synthesis. Again, like RNA synthesis, it's a two metal mechanism of catalysis. On the bottom left is an RNA polymerase that we talked about this lecture before last, and remember, these polymerases, all the different classes, there are four classes of nucleic acid polymerase, all four look similar, they look like a right hand with a palm domain, that's the active site, thumb and fingers domain, that cradle, the template, and for the RNA polymerase, the active site is in yellow. Above it is a DNA polymerase structure, and its active site is in yellow as well. The other parts are different colors, unfortunately. I didn't make this particular figure. But here we have a double-stranded DNA moving through it, and of course, the polymerization is going to happen at the active site. When DNA is replicated, it's often a double-stranded molecule that is being copied. So the, in many cases, the double-stranded molecule will move into the polymerase, but it has to be, the strands have to be separated, of course. We'll, we'll talk a little bit about how that happens. On the right, of course, is the two-metal mechanism of catalysis. This is DNA. The template is shown on the right, three bases joined by phosphodiester bonds. And here we have three new bases that have been added. And the last one, the thymine, is going to be added 
and you can see the reaction where the triphosphate, the TTP, here there are the three phosphates, alpha, beta, and gamma phosphate. Two are being removed by magnesium mediated catalysis so that we end up with one phosphate in between. That's what we mean by two metal catalysis. Now the host provides a lot for DNA replication just as it provides a lot for RNA synthesis as well, except of course the RNA polymerase doesn't come from the host. But here uh, the host is also essential. DNA replication always requires at least one viral protein. As we'll see as we go through some examples, some viruses require one protein and the host does the rest in terms of DNA replication. Some viruses encode a lot of proteins as well. And so the pox viruses, they replicate in the cytoplasm. They can't access any of the DNA machinery in the nucleus, so they have to make most of their own, but that'll make everything. They still need at least one protein from the host cell to get DNA replication going. So we go from very simple, one protein, to the very complicated. So what I want to do today is give you an overview of this range of DNA replication styles, where one viral protein gets DNA replication started versus many. The polymerase can come from various places, two different places, and we've mentioned this before. For small DNA viruses, they do not encode a DNA polymerase. In fact, that was a, a question on the exam. They don't have enough DNA to do that. Larger virus genomes can encode a DNA polymerase. But small DNA viruses, I, I like to say it this way, they encode proteins that orchestrate the host. They are going to make a protein which is going to divert the host's DNA synthesis apparatus to replicating its genome. Because think of this problem. A virus, a DNA virus comes in a cell. A single genome gets in the nucleus. The cell would laugh at it. What do you want, <laughs> right? And keep replicating its own DNA. So the viral DNA has to somehow attract the host DNA apparatus, and that's what these proteins do. They orchestrate the apparatus to be distracted. And then once they're there, it's too late. The viral DNA is churned out and uh, all hell breaks loose. As I said, a large DNA viruses encode a good amount of their replication system. This includes the herpes viruses, the adenoviruses, the pox viruses. We'll talk about them today. And of course, the simpler viruses include the papilloma, polyoma, and parvoviruses. We'll talk about two of those today. Besides the DNA-dependent DNA polymerase, which is again shown here, we need other proteins involved in replication. And they can be viral or cellular, depending on how big the viral genome is. We need the polymerase. We need accessory proteins. There are proteins that bind origins. There are helicases that unwind the DNA, exonucleases that cut. You'll see why we need that in a moment. And of course, we have to make the, the precursors, the DNTPs, the viruses don't encode genes that do that. That's all done by the cell. So these are some of the enzymes that are involved in making those triphosphates. Our first question, which statement about viral DNA synthesis is not correct? A, large DNA viruses encode many proteins involved in DNA synthesis. B, small DNA viruses encode at least one protein involved. C, viral DNA replication is always delayed after infection because it requires the synthesis of at least one viral protein. And D, some viruses encode all proteins needed for DNA replication. I thought you would all get 100 on this. 56% of you got D, some, some viruses encode all proteins needed. That's wrong. I want to know the wrong answer here. So maybe that trips you up sometime. <laughs> yeah. Some viruses encode all the proteins you need. I said that wasn't right. So I think you know you just misinterpreted the question. Now we have a, a variety of different DNA structures that have to be replicated. And they're shown here. We're going to go through these and see how they work. We have single-stranded viral DNAs with these interesting TRs. That stands for terminal repeat at each end. We have closed circular double-stranded DNA. And then we have a variety of linear double-stranded DNAs, the adenovirus, herpes simplex, and vaccinivirus DNAs. And this picture shows you some of the features of these genomes. One is shown the origin of replication, where replication begins. You can see for the single-stranded viruses, parvoviruses, it's at one end. And it's shown uh, binding a viral origin binding protein. And there's some cellular replication proteins there as well. SV40, there's the origin. Adenovirus, there's an origin at 
both ends. And for herpes, there are three origins. And for vaccinia virus, there's uh, an origin which isn't shown here. This is an interesting molecule because it's not only double-stranded, but the ends are covalently linked. So if you melted this, it would just be a single-stranded circle. We, of course, have many origins on each of our chromosomes. Otherwise, it would take forever for our DNAs to, to multiply. Now, in, when we talk about viral DNA replication, there are two mechanisms. And this is different from us. We only use one mechanism, the one on the left, the replication fork. But we also have, among viruses, strand displacement. So let's look at a replication fork. Uh, this happens for papilloma, polyoma, herpes, and retroviral proviruses. Those are integrated in our DNA, so this is what our DNA is doing. Basically what happens here is you, ha you have a fork where the DNA is being replicated on both strands. And so on one strand, it's it's continuous because you can start with a primer, which is shown in green, and you can keep making DNA continuously. But on the other strand, you have to prime in the other direction, right? Because it's the other strand. And so you can only make as much DNA as the fork has been opened. So that's discontinuous. So the whole process is called semi-discontinuous replication. It's a fork because it looks like a fork. Not the kind I eat with, but it's another kind. It's like if there's a, a fork in the road, take it. These Molecules of DNA are primed with RNA, always RNA primers. That happens in our genomes as well. And the right is a strand displacement where copying the DNA on one strand only, and as the, DNA, as the new product is made, it pushes the other strand away. That's why the displacement name comes from. And uh, this happens with adenoviruses, parvoviruses, and poxviruses. This kind of DNA synthesis is never RNA primed. It's always got some other kind of primer, which varies according to the virus. For adenovirus, it's a protein primer. Uh, for parvo and pox, it's a DNA hairpin. So the two different ways that viruses replicate their DNA, RNA primer dependent mechanism is associated with a problem. And that's the five prime end problem, which you've probably encountered before. But here it's illust illustrated, you have a DNA, and we're for simplifying this, we're taking out the replication for it, just looking at one strand. We have a series of prime RNA primers that are priming DNA synthesis in red. A part of the DNA synthesis process is we have to, once the DNA is made, we have to excise the RNA. There's an enzyme associated with the DNA polymerase that does that, and then fills in the gaps and you can do that because the, at the five prime end, it would be the primer, which is the previous strand that's been made. So you don't need to make another RNA primer. And you ligate them together, but the problem is the way at the end, you can't fill it in because there's no primer. And so that's the five prime end problem. We have solved it in our genomes by having telomeres on our chromosomes, which are highly repeated sequences added by enzymes so that they don't get shorter. And as you get older, your telomeres get shorter and shorter because your telomerase doesn't work so well. That's one of the things that happens uh, when you get older. Viruses do not have telomeres or, or telomerases, so they have other ways to solve this problem. And that's one of the things I want to show you today, how viruses get around the five prime end problem. So let's start with SV40. Almost everything we know about DNA replication was initially figured out with SV40 many, many years ago because people couldn't study DNA synthesis, right? We take a eukaryotic cell. The DNA is huge. You purify it, it breaks up. Impossible. But SV40, five kilobase, double-stranded circular DNA comes in a package, a virus particle. All you have to do is grow the virus, extract the DNA, and then you can add it to replication systems. Beautiful system. So that people learned a lot from this. So the genome is a circular, double-stranded DNA molecule. It has a single origin of replication. And what that means, of course, is that that is where DNA synthesis initiates. And it goes in both directions from the origin. So it's bidirectional. And you can see on the left, we're showing you a schematic of that. The origin, the replication fork is forming. And then the forks go in both directions. So there's a fork on the left and the fork on the right as well. And you can see here, you're going to have continuous and discontinuous synthesis. I'm going to show you that in a moment. But you can't make a continuous 
synthesis on both strands. Now this uh, image at the top was one of the first images to prove that replication occurs bidirectionally from this origin. What they did is they took SV40 DNA, they cut it with a restriction enzyme, which would give you a molecule where the origin wasn't right in the center, it was offset to one side, and then they put this DNA into replication systems, and they could see the origin right there in the first panel is that little bubble, and then it gets bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. And they could tell it was going in both directions because they could see it moving towards one end and towards the other end of the molecule. So there you can see a very large replication bubble. Now how this works uh, is detailed here. So on the top is the SV40 origin and the replication fork, the bidirectional fork. There's the origin. And we've already made some DNA on either side of the origin. And you can see there are two leading and two lagging strands, if you will. The leading can be made by a single RNA primer in green and then synthesis. And as this fork opens and the DNA denatures, that strand can keep going continuously without any stopping until it gets to the other end. Now on the other strand, you can't do that, as I said, because it's the, the synthesis has to occur in a five to three prime direction. So you can only start wherever the single strand of DNA has, has gone so far. So you'll make a, a series of short pieces, all RNA prime, and then as the bubble gets bigger, you have more single stranded DNA exposed, you can make more discontinuous fragments. And as I said in the end, they're all, the RNAs are all removed and they're ligated together. There's no end problem here. Why? There's no end, right? It's a circle. Brilliant. We don't have circles in our chromosomes, unfortunately, but there's no, and you just go all the way around the circle. And if you started with an RNA primer, where that DNA ends, you just have to get rid of the RNA and fill it in. No end problem. So that's one solution to the five prime end problem. You simply have a circular DNA genome. The bottom just shows you the uh, five prime end problem on a linear molecule. So a lot of virus DNAs are circular, in part for this reason, because you don't have an end problem. You don't have to lose sequence if you, when you get rid of the primer. So that is semi-discontinuous, and it's bidirectional, going both directions from the origin, and there are two replication forks. So how does this work? How does the virus orchestrate the host? Because this is a virus with a small DNA genome. I'm going to show you a series of pictures. And you're going to say, oh my gosh, these are ridiculously complicated. I can't remember that. You don't have to remember them. There's just a few key things I want you to know about them. And I'll show you it as I go along. But all this, again, was sorted out with SV40. But we understand that this happens in our cells now as well. So at the top, we have our SV40 DNA. Just a little bit of the genome showing you the origin of replication in the middle there. This DNA gets into a cell. It cannot start replicating because it's lost in the sea of cellular DNA. So what happens is an mRNA is made for a protein called large T, LT, or you can call it T antigen, but you're going to remember that because that protein is going to come back multiple times until the very last lecture in this course, large T antigen. That's the protein that will orchestrate the host's DNA replication system and direct it to the viral DNA. And LT is shown here as a, as a rectangle, essentially. And what it does, it binds specifically to the viral origin. And in fact, it binds in, in hexamers on either side of the origin. So on one side, there are six copies. On the other side, there are six copies as well. And what it does it has multiple functions. But first thing it does is to melt the origin. The origin is double-stranded. and You need to melt it denature the two strands, separate the two strands so the DNA polymerase can get in and start copying. So that's the first function of large T antigen. This is a ATP dependent reaction, this denaturing. Uh, and then you can see this other protein, this kind of yellow protein called RPA. It's coming in, it's coating the single strands. This is a cellular protein whose function is to keep the origin melted because if you don't, it will just snap back together again because the T antigens have moved a bit away from it. So the T antigens bind the origin, they melt it. You can see they have helicase activity that's part of that melting. 
And then this RPA actually initially comes into the complex because it binds to T antigen. And that's how the T antigen is recruiting the DNA synthesis machinery. That's the first step. So we have a little bubble here, a melt single strand on either side that's been formed by LT pulling in this single-stranded DNA binding protein. And then we begin to make uh, DNA. The first enzyme that comes in is called the primase. This is going to make the primers, the RNA primers, you can tell from the name. And that's brought in via interactions with RPA, which was brought in via T antigen, and also it binds to uh, LT as well. And that primase will first make RNA primers, and then it will make short pieces of DNA. Uh, but to get longer pieces of DNA, uh, you have to have other proteins come in, in particular the polymerase, which here is labeled polymerase epsilon. So a lot of other proteins are coming in here uh, that have functions in establishing the replication complex. The main point is that the T antigen is recruiting this machinery in this way. It's melting the origin. And then various polymerases come in initially to make primers, and then short DNAs and eventually long DNA can be made when Paul Epsilon comes in. Is, you can find movies of this process on YouTube which are amazing. They've got the whole thing animated and you can see what all these proteins are doing and how the DNA is, is being copied. It's incredibly fast. It has to be fast to, to copy big genomes. Amazing that it works. So now you're making leading and lagging strands. Kind of hard to see on these diagrams, but the illustration I gave you before is more clear. One strand is Continuous synthesis, the leading strand, the lagging strands are discontinuous synthesis, and you can see there are polymerases involved in that, epsilon, and a, and a variety of other proteins as well. Uh, the, the loop gets bigger, you're making DNA on both sides of the fork, uh, and then eventually you have to remove the RNA primers. You can, just, you can barely see them here in green. Those are the RNA primers on both sides. Those are removed by an enzyme called RNA-SH, we're going to come back to RNA-SH next time. RNA-SH acts on a double-stranded molecule of DNA and RNA and removes the RNA portion. And this removes the RNA primer, uh, and then it's filled in, and the ends are ligated together. So you have a nice duplex on either side. And this continues around the entire circle to, to duplicate it. And it's very fast. Now, when this happens, two things occur that have to be dealt with. First of all, as you are unwinding the origin and it's spreading on both sides, the unwinding is transferred to the bottom of the molecule. So it gets more and more twisted. That's shown on this slide here. So the parts of the DNA that are not yet melted get overwound. That has to be released. Otherwise, eventually the polymerase would stop. So the winding, again, comes from unwinding the origin. Covalently closed circular DNA molecule, when you unwind one part, it has to go to another part. So that's why the bottom becomes overwound. So there's a topoisomerase, cellular enzyme, can be topoisomerase one or two, cuts one strand, and like, a, like an elastic band, all the tension is relieved. So these are, that's what we call relaxed supercoil. So as these molecules get overwound, they get cut with topoisomerase one. And then at the end, when we finish DNA replication, now we have two double-stranded molecules. And the original two are now in, one strand is in one new DNA and the other strand is in the other. But the problem is, they are, they are linked. They are linked like this. The product of this, which you can't really see, maybe you could work it out in your head, are two circles that are linked and you cannot get them apart unless you cut them. So that's what topoisomerase 2 does. It cuts the DNA and re-ligates it. It's an energy-dependent reaction, so you can get those two circles. Remarkable. So two topoisomerases, one to nick to release the tension during polymerization, and then a second to actually cut the DNA to release it. Now, you may think this sometimes makes mistakes, and yeah, you'd be right. The rejoining is sometimes not perfect, and that's where mutations may arise. So all these steps are mutation-prone. All right, the SV40 genome is a circular double-stranded DNA. Which statement is correct? T antigen binds and unwinds the ORI. Replication is bidirectional from a single ORI. The 5' prime end problem is solved, has leading and lagging strand synthesis, or all of the above. 98% got all of the above, which is correct. 
they're all right. All right, so we did SV40, circular double-stranded DNA. Lots of viruses have that, that's how they work. Let's look at a single-stranded DNA virus, parvoviruses. So here's the genome, which we've seen multiple times in various contexts. And it is a single-stranded DNA with two terminal repeats, which I've drawn as these T structures there. And this genome doesn't encode a lot of proteins, encodes a couple of proteins in this open reading frame called REP, and REP stands for replication. So these are gonna include proteins that orchestrate the host. And then the capsid proteins are on the right here. In certain types of these single-stranded DNA viruses will come back as we talk about viral gene therapy in the last lecture. It turns out they are really good for delivering genes to people. They're being used in all sorts of therapy applications. So the ends look like this at the bottom. That's the sequence of the two ends, the terminal repeats. And you can see they are complementary so that they can base pair and they're forming this T structure. Now why do they do that? Well, you'll see why in some detail, but see that three prime hydroxyl? That is going to be the primer for DNA synthesis. So you don't need to make an RNA primer. You just prime at this structure that's formed naturally in the viral DNA. This viral DNA comes in the nucleus but before it can replicate, remember it has to make at least one protein. It's got to make one of these rep proteins. But single-stranded DNA can't be the substrate for transcription. The DNA polymerase comes from the host, but it won't come to this molecule until the protein is made. It sounds like a conundrum, but what in fact happens is the cell sees this molecule and just repairs it. It fills in this single strand here. And so the first step is a repair reaction. Uh, shown in this scheme. So if we go to the left here, this is the overall scheme of reaction. We start with our genome, which can form these hairpins at either end. Uh, the cell repairs the single strand by starting at that three prime hydroxyl. And now the red part has been added. So now that's uh, double stranded. That can serve as a substrate for transcription. And indeed it does. mRNAs are made from this. And one of them encodes a protein, the rep 78 slash 68 protein. And it has several functions. In this case, though, it makes a nick right at the left end of the molecule where that arrow is. Site of sequence specific nick. Without that nick, no more DNA synthesis would happen. And that's because the nick produces another three prime end, which is going to be elongated from. So, what I've done on this image is to stretch out the um, Hair, the hairpins at either end now to give you a fully double-stranded linear molecule. And in fact, if you go from that first molecule in step four, just before step four, you make the nick with the rep protein, uh, and then the three prime end at D is extended to fill in the rest of the molecule. Again, by cellular polymerases that uh, can now be recruited by the rep protein. And then we have a fully duplex molecule. It can form hairpins at one end, as you can see here. Uh, and then one of those three prime hydroxyls is the primer for bona fide DNA replication. So that's shown in light pink after step C. So this is strand displacement now. The polymerase is copying one strand. The other strand is being pushed off on the top. And that top strand, when it finally comes off, is shown after step seven. It's labeled genomic uh, DNA. And then below it is a double strand product of displacement synthesis. And you can see one original blue strand. The red was produced uh, after the nick and priming at the three prime hydroxyl. Uh, and then you have one new strand. So that is basically where you were to begin with. It can go back into this cycle. It gets nicked again by rep 78. And then the polymerase will go in and make more molecules as well. So there's no primers needed. The three prime hydroxyl primer is built into the genome. And there's no end problem by virtue of these repeated sequences at each end, which get copied over and over. You regenerate the end so you don't lose the end. The three prime hydroxyl serves as a primer. So again, the end problem is solved by this configuration. So that's why there are T structures at either end to serve as primers and to conserve the genome sequence. So this is a displacement synthesis. It's continuous because the, the 
Polymerase can go all the way down one strand. There's no need for discontinuous synthesis in the other direction. It uses polymerases of the host cell, but it doesn't require the alpha polymerase, which makes primers and short DNAs, which we saw in the SV40 scheme. And as I said, the Rep7868 uh, is a nicking protein to, to form that first nick. It's also a helicase. It also binds the 5 prime N, which is the origin of replication, essentially. So this is a, an interesting way to get around the problem. So we've got this initial rep protein made, and that will recruit the polymerase of the host cell to the DNA and replicate it. Moving up in size to adenovirus. So now we have a 36,000 base pair double-stranded DNA. It is within an icosahedral capsid, as you can see, and we've seen that before. The DNA is shown there. It's got an origin of replication at both ends. So that should tell you that we're going to start replicating at both ends. They're labeled ORI. This occurs by strand displacement, as you will see. Semi-conservative, of course, like everything else. So how does this work? So now this is a virus that encodes its own DNA polymerase. Remember, adenovirus DNA comes in the cell, and you make E1A protein, which then turns on the synthesis of early genes, and those encode proteins needed for DNA replication. So again, you need to have at least one protein made to get DNA replication to occur. In this case, it includes the DNA polymerase. You can't replicate this genome until you make the DNA polymerase. So here we have a molecule of DNA where we've gone through all that early gene expression, and now we have a molecule of polymerase shown in purple. So that is a viral encoded protein. This DNA will go in the nucleus because it requires other factors needed for DNA replication that it doesn't encode, but it encodes the DNA polymerase. And we see it at one three prime end, which is one of the origins of replication. And the polymerase is attached to a pink protein called PTP. That stands for preterminal protein. And the terminal protein is attached via a serine to a C a nucleotide residue, which is C. And that's going to be the primer for DNA synthesis. A simple protein linked to one base. That base will base pair with the very last G in the viral genome. You can see the polymerase is binding to the terminal protein. That's the initiation complex. And that will start DNA synthesis on the one strand. The light blue strand is going to be copied. You can see in step two, we're making a complementary strand, which is shown red here, to show you that it's new. Uh, and it's strand displacement. We're displacing the top strand. And as that top strand comes off, it's coated with that yellow protein, which is a DNA binding protein, a single-stranded DNA binding protein. Its function is to keep that DNA from hybridizing to its complementary strand. So eventually, when you have made the entire complement of that lower strand that we started. Uh, you can see that is in step three here. Now you have a full duplex DNA with one new strand. That will go around, and same thing will happen on it. So you'll keep making double-stranded DNAs uh, from that. Meanwhile, the other strand, we don't waste. The other strand is coated with single-stranded DNA binding proteins in yellow, but the ends are not coated in single-stranded DNA binding proteins. In fact, they are complementary. They have inverted terminal repeats at either end of the genome, so they can hybridize and form this little duplex labeled A and A prime. It looks exactly like the end of the viral genome. It's a double-stranded DNA. So the polymerase sees it, binds to it, and starts to copy it. If it weren't double-stranded at the end, the polymerase wouldn't see it, it would never get replicated, and it would be wasted as a single strand just thrown away. But here, because the ends are complementary, ITRs, inter inverted terminal repeats, the polymerase recognizes it. And here in step five, you have priming with the terminal protein C complex. And now we have the polymerase making a complementary strand. So now we can have a second duplex made. So both strands are copied, made duplex, and you get a lot of DNA synthesis. Again, there's no end problem because the polymerase is able to initiate exactly at the last base, and it doesn't need a primer to do that except the C residue attached to a protein. And that C residue becomes part of the product, so there's no need to remove it as if it were an RNA primer. So this is another way of solving 
the end problem, we use a protein primer and initiate right at the end of the DNA. So we have three ways of solving the end problem. A circle, the terminal repeats with, with parvoviruses, and now a priming with a protein. This single-stranded binding protein is very interesting. So not only does it bind the single strand as it's displaced, but it actually helps to melt the duplex. And that's shown here on the next slide. Uh, here's the adenovirus single-stranded DNA binding protein, and here's the polymerase copying the lower strand. The top strand is being displaced. This, this single-stranded DNA binding protein is binding to the single strand, and it also helps to melt the duplex to allow the polymerase to move along and copy the DNA. How is DNA replication of parvovirus and adenovirus similar? They both require protein-linked primers. Replication occurs by strand displacement. DNA synthesis occurs in the cytoplasm. A replication fork occurs in both. None of the above. Now, sim how are they similar? So most of you got B, replication occurs by strand displacement. They're both strand displacement. They don't need, both need protein-linked primers. Parvoviruses, remember the primer is the three prime end of the genome. Doesn't happen in the cytoplasm. They are both strand displacement, so there's no replication fork. And uh, herpes simplex, we're getting even bigger. We have even more components of the DNA replication apparatus encoded by the virus. So this is a, uh, an envelope virus in which there is a nucleocapsid, which is a icosahedral shell with a DNA genome in it. And you can see here very nicely, between the nucleocapsid and the membrane, there are all these proteins, over 20 proteins in there, one of which is VP16, the transcriptional activator we talked about last time. This virus uh, delivers the DNA into the nucleus, as we saw last time, and it uh, is replicated, as we'll see in a moment. It has three origins. You can see an ORI L and two ORI Ss. Why would you have more than one? Probably so. It's a big DNA molecule, so you can replicate it in a timely fashion. And as we'll see, the DNA comes in as a linear molecule is converted to a circle, and it replicates as a rolling circle. We'll see what that is in a moment. But I just want to point out here in the upper right, these are all viral proteins that participate in DNA replication. For the simplest virus, these all come from the host. SV40, they mostly, they all came from the host with the exception of T antigen. But herpes encodes primases, three different enzymes, three different proteins that are primase that make RNA primers. A processivity protein, processivity simply means that a polymerase has a greater chance of going the entire distance than falling off. If an enzyme has low processivity, it quits a lot. If it has high processivity, it keeps going. And that can be determined by ancillary proteins. We have an origin binding protein. So this would be analogous to T antigen. We have a single-stranded DNA binding protein, which you've seen work at work for adenovirus, and the DNA polymerase itself. And you can take plasmids encoding these proteins and put them in a cell with a piece of herpes DNA and it will replicate, showing that these are needed. Of course, you're still using host proteins as well. So how does this work? First, the DNA comes in the nucleus as a double-stranded linear molecule. There's a host cell DNA ligase called XRCC4, which brings the ends together and ligates them. So now you have a circular molecule, covalently closed circular molecule. So now it's looking a lot like SV40, but it's not going to replicate like SV40 at all. But again, this is circularized by host proteins, not by viral proteins. And this is rolling circle replication. A rolling circle gathers no moss, I like to say. We start with a double-stranded DNA. One strand now has to be nicked Otherwise, we cannot, we don't have a free three prime hydroxyl on which to polymerize. And you can see in the next step, we're starting to polymerize new DNA in red at that three prime hydroxyl. So the three prime end made by nicking by a viral protein is serving as a primer. And that is moving around the circle. It's displacing the other strand. You can see the blue strand is coming off here. And that simply goes around the molecule and as it does, the other strand is peeling off. So this um, five prime end in blue, which initially is coming off here, it gets longer and longer as the, as the polymerase moves around the circle. And then there's actually discontinuous DNA synthesis on the dark blue strand. 
All right, and you can see that is primed by RNA primers, which eventually have to be removed. And here at the bottom is illustration of the end of this. You can make very, very long DNAs, and as soon as there is a unit, a genome length, at that point there's a signal and it gets cut by an enzyme, and now you have a new genome, and then you make another and another and another. And there's no end problem on these because uh, you can see the polymerase can simply go through all the way from one end to another. As long as you're peeling off a template, uh, you can make the ends exact. I guess the very last one would have an end problem, but if you're making hundreds and hundreds, that doesn't really matter. So no end problem, a unique way of synthesizing, different from SV40. So we don't have to worry about all the twisting of the template because it's nicked and we have rolling circle replication. And one more because it's really different. It's pox virus, and it's different because it replicates in the cytoplasm. All the other viruses we've talked about so far uh, go into the nucleus, and pox virus stays in the cytoplasm, as well as many of these giant DNA viruses that we've mentioned. They also replicate in the cytoplasm, but this has been really well studied. Again, a big double-stranded DNA molecule. Uh, over 300,000 bases in length, so it's much bigger than anything we've talked about so far. Uh, and it's double-stranded, and the ends are covalently joined in what we call a terminal loop. And this DNA also has inverted terminal repeats at either end, and you're going to see how that functions in a moment. Now, here's an experiment to show you DNA replication in the cytosol. We call these, where the virus replicates, we call them uh, DNA factories, and in fact, not only is the DNA replicating in them, but the virus particles get assembled there as well. These are three different uh, views of an infected cell. On the left, the cell has been stained for DNA, and it's blue. This is a pox virus infected cell. So the nucleus is blue, of course, because that's where the host DNA is. But you can see also outside of the nucleus, there are these round blue areas. Those are the factories where the virus is replicating. On the middle panel, we have stained with an antibody to the DNA binding protein. It's a viral DNA binding protein, very much functionally, very much like the ones we've talked about, say, for adenovirus, keeping single strand, single stranded. But you can see uh, there's none of that in the nucleus, which is consistent with the fact that this virus doesn't replicate there. They're in the cytoplasm. And then if you merge panels one and two, computationally merge the two, you can see uh, that the DNA and the DNA binding protein co-localized to the cytoplasm. So those are the cytoplasmic factories where uh, this virus is replicating. So we have a, a, an unusual double-stranded DNA shown at the top left there. The ends are covalently linked, as you can see. So as you might guess, they have to be nicked. You have to introduce a nick here to give you a three prime end. The end is then unwound, filled in in one direction, very much like the parvovirus scheme. Uh, and then you can have the terminal structures form, forming on both strands. You've now essentially copied the terminal structure. And then we can jump here to step four. That gets extended further by viral DNA polymerase. And at the bottom, basically, that has extended all the way to one end of the molecule around the terminal loop at that end and all the way back on the top molecule. So that double-stranded molecule in four has been copied to a second molecule throughout its length, going from one end to the other end and back again. So the, you end up with a very long, twice genome sized double-stranded DNA. And then there are enzymes that cut the terminal loop and do what we call resolution to separate the two DNA molecules. And again, you don't need an RNA primer because the polymerase is using the DNA 3' prime hydroxyl generated by nicking. There's no end problem because of the repeated ends, which are copied. So the duplication ensures that you're not going to lose an end. Much of this is carried out by viral proteins. We're not quite sure how many. There are at least 15 involved in viral DNA synthesis, maybe more. But again, it needs something from the host cell because the virus cannot do it on its own. No virus can do DNA synthesis on its own. From the simplest to the most complex, they always need something from the host cell. And we, we still haven't found a virus that, that does not. What makes pox virus DNA replication different from all the other viruses we discussed? The complete replication machinery is encoded by the viral genome. DNA synthesis occurs in the nucleus. 
DNA synthesis occurs by strand displacement, none of the above. Most of you got none of the above, which is the right answer. Uh, it's the complete DNA replication is never encoded by the viral genome. A lot of it is, but not all of it. Now, this particular virus doesn't occur in the nucleus, it occurs in the cytoplasm. Strand displacement is true, but it's not different from other viruses in that sense. Other viruses do strand displacement also. Now let's go back to the beginning, to viral origins. And I want to talk a little bit about these and the proteins that bind them. Remember, the origin of replication is where DNA synthesis begins. There are specific places on the viral genome. We talked about the origin for SV40, the origin at the end of the parvovirus single-stranded DNA, origins at either end of the adenovirus genome. The herpes has internal origins. So that rolling circle where the NIC occurs is going to occur at several places, and you're going to get replication from several origins. And so what actually are these? Of course, I showed you that that's where DNA synthesis begins, but how does it work? So there's specific sequences involved, for sure, because you can take an origin, say a 100 base pair fragment of DNA with an origin, and put it into another molecule, and that will serve as an origin of replication. These typically are AT-rich segments. They're recognized by origin binding proteins like T antigen. And as I said, that's where DNA synthesis begins. So let's take a look at some viral origins. Here are three different viral origins of replication. At the top is SV40. And the core origin is shown in brackets. And in yellow are the sequences that are bound by large T in the case of SV40, or any origin binding protein, depending on the virus. It's all three have yellow segments that show sequences bound by origin recognition proteins. And then we have AT-rich sequences, which are shown in a, a kind of an olive color. And why do we have AT-rich sequences? AT is a lot easier to melt than GC. If you had less AT, it would be hard to melt these, and probably would DNA replication would occur, occur more slowly. So the origins always have those. And then there's something very interesting in all of these uh, origins. The other color, the binding sites for transcriptional regulators. Last time we talked about uh, DNA sequences that engage transcriptional regulators. And you can see they're right next to the origins. So here is some transcription factor called SP1. We have an enhancer here nearby. The uh, herpes simplex or EL actually has a promoter going in two different directions on either side of the origin. Uh, and also at the adeno origin, which is at one end, there, is, uh, there are binding sites for two uh, different transcription factors. And this is a typical scenario. The transcriptional regulation areas seem to be typically near origins of replication. But the key point here is that this is a nucleation point for the entire DNA replication apparatus, it all starts with a single origin binding protein and then involves more and more proteins coming in, as we've talked about. Now, I want to look at one origin binding protein in a little detail, and that's the origin binding protein of SV40. Again, it's going to bind to the origin, and it's going to specifically recognize these yellow sequences. These are the large T binding sites. If you change those, the sequences, the protein will no longer bind. So there's a specific interaction between the protein and the DNA. So those are the sequences on the DNA that are important. Um, and let's take a look at the sequences in the protein. Here are the viral recognition proteins that we've talked about today. Uh, the T antigen. We haven't mentioned papillomaviruses. These are viruses very similar to the polyomas. They have an origin binding protein, the parvovirus rep. 6878 is an origin binding protein, the preterminal protein uh, of adenovirus, and a protein of herpes simplex. So in every case, there is a protein that binds the origin that helps to get DNA replication started. And those interactions are shown again on the picture on the right. So here's the SV40 large T protein, which of course is an origin binding protein. Remember, this is the first protein that has to be made in SV40 infected cells in order to get DNA synthesis going. Without large T, DNA replication will not occur. So at the top is a diagram of the large T protein. 
This has been called the most studied protein on Earth. It's been studied by many, many labs for, for many, many years because it has so many different functions. It's not just an origin binding protein. And on the protein are shown some of the functional domains that have been mapped by mutational analysis. For example, first there's a nuclear localization signal, right? This protein is made in the cytoplasm. It's got to get in the nucleus because that's where viral DNA replication occurs. So there's an NLS right there, which specifies import. And we have a sequence of the protein that's needed for origin DNA binding. That's the part of the protein that interacts with the origin sequences on the DNA. We have ATPase regions, so some of the reactions mediated by T, like unwinding of DNA, require energy, and that requires uh, an ATPase domain. We have an helicase domain because also, this protein also unwinds uh, DNA. We have part of the protein that interacts with the polymerase, Paul alpha. That's the primase that's first brought in to the origin to make RNA primers and then short DNA. So that interacts with large T. So that's how the primase is brought in by protein-protein interaction. These, are, these proteins tend to be species-specific. There are polyomaviruses that infect only certain kinds of animals, like primates versus rodents and so forth. And it's often due to the sequence of T antigen because the pre-initiation complexes don't form. These proteins, if you infect the wrong host, they take, let's take a monkey SV40 and infect a hamster, the T antigen cannot recruit the DNA machinery of the hamster cell. And so that determines species specificity. And it's particularly at this first step, the interaction with the Paul alpha, which uh, involves that domain there. Now you may see some other interactors here that you don't understand, and those include RB and P53. And we mentioned RB last time as this protein in the cell that normally sequesters E2F and silences promoters. We haven't talked about P53 yet, but these are part of a bigger story that we're gonna start building on today, and this will get us through the very end, uh, the last lecture as well. And that is DNA viruses, remember, from the smallest to the biggest, need to utilize host DNA replication proteins. A resting cell is not making DNA replication proteins. There's no need. The cell's not dividing. Now, it turns out that most of the cells in your body are not dividing. They're resting. There's some exceptions. Your skin uh, multiplies a lot and falls off. Your intestinal cells multiply quickly, your neurons are not multiplying at all, and most of your cells are not multiplying. Unless you're an athlete working out, your muscles will grow, of course, but if you're not, most of your cells are not dividing. And viruses don't do well in non-dividing cells. In fact, DNA viruses in particular, because they need to use the DNA synthetic apparatus. And that is the fun one of the functions of T antigen. Just think, it is, let's say SV40 goes into a cell in your body, a kidney cell, and these cells are not dividing. The virus is not going to replicate. Okay, so the DNA gets in the nucleus. That first protein made is T antigen, which is going to recruit the DNA replication machinery, right? But if the cell is not dividing, there is no DNA replication machinery to recruit. So what's the, the solution? to have T antigen do something about that resting cell. So what T antigen does is kicks cells into S phase. It makes them divide. It is brilliant. So not only does this protein recruit the DNA synthesis apparatus, but it induces it as well. Every DNA virus has to turn on mitosis, essentially, get the cells to divide, whether it's uh, SV40 or any other virus, the virus will not replicate unless the cell is dividing. And this is an interesting issue because it's eventually going to answer the question of why certain viruses can cause cancer. Now, the uh, replication cycle, of course, is very tightly regulated. You have a roughly 24-hour cycle, which we're depicting here as a circle. You have our mitosis phase in M in red, and that's, of course, when the cells physically divide, and of course the process of division from one to two cells is shown at the top. But once you have two cells, they each go through a growth phase, 
where proteins are synthesized and the cell gets bigger. That's called G1. Then we have the S phase where you duplicate your DNA. And then just before cell division occurs, another phase called G2, and then the cells divide. So a lot of preparation in order to get cells to divide. Now a major checkpoint that tells cells whether to divide or not is this RB protein. The protein we've mentioned briefly. It's the cellular retinoblastoma gene, initially discovered in kids, as I said last time, who have retinal tumor. And so they get it very early in life, and the tumors miss this protein. They don't have RB, or they have an extremely mutated RB. And it turns out that this is a checkpoint protein. So it keeps cells from dividing. As you'll see, cancer is a proliferative disease. When cells divide, too many times, uncontrollably, they sustain mutations, and those mutations make them cancerous. So the first step in a cancer is a cell dividing uncontrollably. RB is one of the checkpoints that keep our cells from dividing. It takes signals from the cell exterior and says, do we need to multiply now or not? So RB is an is a important control site. It turns out that viral proteins like large T bind RB and prevent it from halting the cell cycle. So presence of RB is associated with holding the cell in G1 phase. So the cells are divided and they do not go through the growth phase and proceed through the cycle because of RB. How does RB work? Well, last time I told you that uh, RB is the, is the golden protein here. And on the bottom, we have RB complex with this family of transcription factors, E2F. And remember, uh, those were first discovered because they're needed for transcription of the adenovirus early region. But these are also important in our cells. And in particular, those transcription factors are needed to make the proteins that drive cells through mitosis. So when RB is bound to E2F. Remember, this E2F complex sits near the promoter. If RB is on it, it recruits histone deacetylases, tightens up the chromatin, and shuts down transcription. So this is how RB prevents cells from going through mitosis. It shuts off uh, the genes that are needed for going through the cell cycle. But of course, this is not what the viruses need. They need to have the cells dividing. And so the large T protein of SV40, as well as similar proteins from papillomaviruses, the E1A protein of adenovirus, they all bind RB. And that's shown here. These three proteins, purple, they're binding RB, so it takes RB away from E2F. Now E2F can bind the promoters. There's no RB to inhibit transcription, and these promoters drive the synthesis of proteins that are needed not only for DNA synthesis, but for passing through mitosis. So that's how these DNA viruses ensure that whatever cell they infect is dividing and provides the DNA synthetic apparatus that they need in order to replicate. And it's just a simple protein. The first protein that is made, large T, adeno E1A, papillomavirus uh, E protein, whatever it is, not only does it recruit the synthetic apparatus, but it kicks the cells uh, into dividing. Now this interaction is gonna come back, as I said later. We're gonna talk about transformation and oncogenesis uh, later on, and we're gonna talk about how these proteins play a role in that. And then at the end of the course, we'll actually see how you can design gene therapy vectors to kill tumors based uh, on this interaction. So next time, Monday, we are gonna talk about reverse transcription and integration. We're gonna look at this last class of viruses with RNA genomes that go through a DNA intermediate.